Dr. Ben Bickman, welcome to the Mastering Blood Sugar podcast. Good to have you here, my friend. Oh, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm thrilled. Absolutely. So, uh, Ben, I saw you speak uh, just a couple months ago out in Breckenridge, Colorado at Low Carb Breck, which was a great conference. It was the third time that Dr. Gerber and his crew uh, organized that out there in the mountains. And it was a it's always fun to go out there. It was a great event. And, and I think your presentation was a highlight for me. You talked all about uh, insulin and glucagon and the insulin glucagon ratio, which I'd love to get into a little bit with you here today. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that's been a fun meeting for me. Like I said, I think it was this time when I first started, it was one year ago when, when Jeff reached out and said, Hey, I've just seen some of your work. Do you want to come? That was my absolute first step into into the low carb community you know i'd i'd kind of been publishing scientific manuscripts in that space but not i wasn't at all aware of this you know really remarkable group um of enthusiasts and and scientists in a way and i mean that term very um complimentarily where i'm referring to you know the general the average low carb citizen you know they really they know a lot. Nevertheless, my point, uh, it, it was fun to be invited again. And as I was, when, when Jeff and Rod first offered the invitation to come out, I, you know, you have any topic, you know, a, a, I had any topic at my disposal to focus on. And as I had spent one year sort of in this low carb space, I was struck by how, um, by the conversations that would happen. And when I would hear people expressing this fear of protein um, because of gluconeogenesis and, and I thought uh, that is not a, a, that is not a justified fear. Now, if there is a fear of protein because of its insulinogenic effect that I can understand, but not to fear gluconeogenesis. You know, I was hearing these conversations and I was thinking, well, if it weren't for gluconeogenesis, anyone on a low carb diet would be dead. And so I just thought there's a real fundamental misunderstanding here. And then I thought, well, maybe this is an opportunity to not only get more familiar with the topic myself a little, but then to share some of what I learned. And then that then came together as uh, looking at the relevance of, you know, insulin's, you know, yang, you know, like the yin to the yang where glucagon is sort of the other side to this. Yeah, that's, that's great. And uh, glucagon I find is confusing to a lot of people because, it does raise blood sugar, uh, you know, through the liver. And, and so some people think it's, it's a negative thing, but it also increases uh, fat burning and liberation of energy so we can burn the fuel rather than storing the fuel. So could you maybe just give a, a quick summary of what glucagon does and then contrast that to insulin? Yeah, so you really touched on the, the most relevant detail that you just touched on would be the liver and fat tissue it's basically the two main storage tissues, liver and fat, uh, fat tissue storing fat, and of course, and then liver storing glucose uh, predominantly. It, glucagon is a signal to both of them saying, release that energy that you've been holding on to. Now, it's not the only one to do that. There are other hormones that do that as well. Uh, growth hormone does that. Uh, catecholamines like epinephrine do that. Nevertheless, that's very much within glucagon's realm of, of influence. And because it is so intimately regulated to by glucose levels, uh, that that does represent it does sort of put it at odds with insulin, where as as blood glucose levels change in response to whatever the lifestyle habit or dietary pattern is, then insulin and glucagon are typically kind of waxing and waning. You know, and when one's coming, the other one is is going away, and and, and vice versa. So. Uh, that's the general effect, where, where, whereas insulin is very much anabolic, telling fat tissue and liver, for example, store fat and glucose, respectively. Like we just mentioned, uh, glucagon would be catabolic. It's inducing the release, the breakdown of stored energy to share with the body. Yeah, great summary. So again, this is something that sounds like it potentially could be a negative thing for people with diabetes and blood sugar because it's, you know, it's, it's releasing this energy, releasing more glucose into the blood. Uh, same with growth hormone and, yep. and the catecholamines. So uh, how should we see this hormone and kind of how does the body balance this? 
Yeah, what, so that's a really neat question to explore, especially in the context of a type 1 diabetic, and it, which isn't <clears throat> the majority, of course, of diabetics that are out there nowadays. <clears throat> but with type 1 diabetes, the problem, we have sort of this paracrine effect of insulin or this micro environment of insulin where, uh, and then we have the endocrine or the whole body effect. And as an insulin resistance scientist, I'm studying the systemic or whole body effect of, ins uh, of insulin not working very well or what insulin's doing whole body. But if we zoom in to the islets of the beta cells and we see that sort of micro environment, when you have a type one diabetic who's not making any insulin, right next to the beta cell is the alpha cell making glucagon. And so what happens is insulin normally is released from the beta cell, comes to the alpha cell and inhibits glucagon release from the alpha cell. That's happening in any non-type one diabetics pancreas all the time. However, in the type one diabetic who's not making any insulin, there's no, there's none of this inhibition of glucagon. So even though they're injecting with insulin, that's the endocrine injection. It's, it's flowing uh, systemically. And then the levels that it's, it's, it's sort of, ignoring or not touching this local or, or this very um, specific focal effect within the um, islets of the beta cell. And so the alpha cells, even though they're injecting themselves with insulin to control their blood glucose, what they're doing now is in fact trying to fight between their insulin, the level of insulin they've just injected versus this chronic production of glucagon. And so you you could make the case type 1 diabetes is just as much a disease of too little insulin as it is a disease of too much glucagon. Now, that is not nearly as relevant in a type 2 diabetic who usually is not only still making insulin but making too much. There is, there is very much this uh, antagonistic effect of insulin on the alpha cell. However, in type 2 diabetes, what happens is the alpha cell becomes insulin resistant. And so normally in that microenvironment, insulin's telling the alpha cells to stop producing glucagon, and that's a good thing. That event, that, that process of the alpha cell becoming resistant to insulin, that could be ultimately what flips the switch and, and turns the pre-diabetic person with insulin resistance, whose insulin levels are really high, but whose glucose levels are still normal, because they even they have a lot of insulin, but it's enough to keep their glucose in check, even though they're resistant to insulin. Once the alpha cells begin to become insulin resistant, and now glucagon starts being released like gangbusters, now the liver just starts pumping out the glucose. And that could be what creates that threshold of we've been hyperinsulinemic, but normal glycemic for decades, perhaps. And now that the alpha cells are insulin resistant, perhaps, um, now the glucose starts to climb too. And then now we clinically identify it as, as diabetes. But in a way, despite, or at the risk of going on a tangent, that represents sort of the tragedy of conventional clinical diagnosis of uh, certainly type 2 diabetes, where when we look at it as a glucose disease, it takes us years to actually have the glucose get adversely affected. Whereas if we looked at it as an insulin disease, we could detect it significantly earlier. Yeah, that's so relevant. Uh, there's some disagreement, or maybe these are maybe these are fine points, but I but I think there is something that should be explored here about really insulin's main or chief role, and perhaps there are just multiple roles. But you know, some argue that insulin is really a fat storage hormone, and its its job is really to stimulate the storage of extra energy as fat and you know it, and it obviously stops us from breaking down fat there's others who look at insulin as primarily an inhibitory hormone inhibiting as you said the uh, release of glucagon in the beta or the alpha cells as well as inhibiting the liver in it in gluconeogenesis and and the release of sugar into the bloodstream and that when a type 1 for example doesn't have enough insulin the rise in blood sugar actually comes from, again, the glucagon stimulating yep. the liver and then the liver dumping too much sugar. So it's, it's not so much that uh, they don't have enough insulin to put the sugar into the cells. It's that the insulin isn't having that effect on the liver to suppress the release of sugar from the liver. And I, I hope I didn't just 
No, that's I, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> um, where in that instance of the diabetic, especially uh, even with a type two diabetic, where in a type one diabetic you have this excess glucagon driving um, glucose liver liver glucose release, and then in the type two diabetic we have this potential of the liver cells becoming insulin resistant. And whereas normally the in, uh, liver, insulin would tell the liver cells, take in glucose and store it as glycogen, that signal is lost. And so even though insulin's high after having just had a high carb meal, the liver doesn't get the message and just keeps pumping out the glucose even when it shouldn't be. Yeah, fascinating. And I see this a lot of people, it seems like probably 40, 50% of my patients and clients have this dawn phenomenon where the, the blood sugar is higher in the morning. And that seems to be particularly tied to uh, insulin resistance in the liver and the effect that the li- that insulin should have on the liver in preventing those morning surges of, of extra glucose into the bloodstream. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Well said. Okay. So let's now tie these together with this insulin glucagon ratio uh, is this something that's clinically useful or is this more of a research tool uh, to learn about how these hormones interact with the body and yeah. how different macronutrients affect them? What a great question. That's not something anyone's asked. Um, <clears throat> I think that clinically it would have limited utility simply because these are two very uncommonly measured hormones. You know, most people will never get their insulin or their glucose, their glucagon measured in their whole life. It's just, these are not typically, they're not on the radar now. And moreover, the ratio that I presented, which was absolutely valid in the 1970s, the, which was sort of almost like a one-to-one sort of ratio with the high sensitivity assays available nowadays the ratio is not nearly as tidy. It, it ends up being like a sort of 1,000 to 1 sort of ratio. Now, nevertheless, I, I would, at the risk of sort of throwing it out entirely and someone sort of groaning and thinking, well, what was the point of that whole talk? Um, I, I think if someone really were determined, they could measure their you know, basal insulin and glucagon and come up with their own ratio that represents this fasted catabolic state and then it could become there could be some utility to try and tracking that but in the end it's not feasible until we have you know at home insulin and glucagon monitors right right, right. um, which hopefully will happen Um, so until then it really is academic Um, yet there is nevertheless a relevant application to it where a person can still sort of ask the question what would this meal or what is my lifestyle doing to my insulin to glucagon ratio? And if my, my goal is to maintain, you know, a healthy fit body, then the more that insulin to glucagon ratio is low, the better, the closer you'll be to helping that happen. So in a way it just sort of represents this abstract ideal um, rather than uh, an actual ability to identify your insulin to glucagon ratio at any given moment. Great. And, you know, you gave this incredible presentation, I think it was 30 to 40 minutes. So uh, there's a lot of information there, but can you uh, perhaps summarize some of the findings from uh, maybe extract some of that data and and some of those clinical uh, applications from what you presented? Yeah. One of the, one of the key takeaways that I'd want someone to appreciate is that in the low carb community, we, we can't keep talking about gluconeogenesis in a negative light. And that was one admittedly quiet takeaway I hoped would would come from my talk. It's not right to say that. Uh, Like I'd mentioned earlier, and right when we started, the fact that you could make the case that the reason the insulin to glucagon ratio stays so similar to a fasted state in a low carb diet, even with consumption of protein, is that because the person's eating so little glucose, they must be making glucose in the liver. And the liver indeed is very well equipped to do that. Um, And and while insulin and glucagon, insulin stays relatively low and glucagon enjoys a bit of a bump, that allows gluconeogenesis to occur, which helps the low carb individual maintain normal glycemia. And so people are talking about gluconeogenesis as if it's a very negative thing. And and yet it, it is essential. If it weren't for that process, we couldn't do low carb 
And indeed, as a species, we couldn't have survived in a low carb environment or any fasted state um, for any period of time. Uh, we would we would be dead. Um, so it, it's I, I I hope that the the um, vernacular somewhat changes or, or or the the conversation changes in a way so that we stop mentioning gluconeogenesis when I think we actually intend to be talking about the insulinogenic effect of where it is of whatever it is we're eating. And so it is relevant to say, yep, protein is insulinogenic. Well, it's more accurate to say individual amino acids have varying levels of of in, uh, inducing an insulin spike. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, part of what was so enlightening uh, as I prepared that talk was to see the disparate effects in a high carb fed person where there is no need for gluconeogenesis. And so it's okay if insulin goes high because if insulin is up, insulin inhibits gluconeogenesis. Insulin's not telling, it wants to, rather than have the liver be releasing, releasing making and releasing glucose, insulin wants to tell the liver, take it in, take it in, take it in. And it can say that in a high carb fed person because the person's eating enough carbs on their own. However, when you eat that same protein in a low carb state, you can't afford to stop gluconeogenesis. You still need gluconeogenesis to happen. And thus there is in fact little to no insulin spike in that instance, despite the same consumption of protein. Interesting. So oftentimes when we look at insulin resistant individuals, whether they're pre-diabetic or in the earlier stages of type 2 diabetes, they also have elevated insulin. They have hyperinsulinemia. And so there's a clinical idea of let's do everything we can to lower the blood insulin levels and of course also improve insulin sensitivity at the cell level. Would the insulinogenic effects of protein then be a negative thing where we'd want to, you know, be careful which proteins we consume or not to overconsume protein? Or does this somehow uh, not become uh, either relevant or, uh, or is, it, is, is there a different way to look at it in a favorable way? Yeah. So, <clears throat> I'd say if someone has, if someone's hyperglycemic and is metabolically unhealthy, there may be justification for keeping protein at a relatively lower degree. However, there's a, there's a consequence to that. And when you start um, reducing dietary protein, you do reduce muscle protein synthesis that will be compromised. And so let's say if you and I, if we were talking about an older patient, you know, someone 65 or let's just say an, an older or older and they're, they're overweight, um, pre-diabetic or type two diabetic, what kind of dietary changes would we want? In fact, it was that sort of situation that got me thinking about this where people are so afraid of protein that they're eating too little and and sure if we put them on a low carb diet that is just i would say extremely um high fat at the expense of protein and i would say the carbs are irrelevant um but we are yep sure we're probably losing fat mass very quickly as insulin has come down so dramatically but without a doubt we're also losing pro uh, muscle protein and that is not protein that they're going to be able to make up for as we get older. And so there's a, there's very much a consequence to being so determined to be in ketosis all the time or put our ketones so high that, that we fear whatever little blip of insulin may happen from protein consumed that, oh, this will lower my ketones. And I would say if someone, especially an older individual, now, Brian, I'm going to just throw this, I'm going to just pull this number out of my pocket. But if someone's ketones, I'd say are consistently well above two for an older individual, they may be eating too little protein. Um, and, and they would need to scrutinize uh, whether or not they are actually getting sufficient protein to maintain muscle protein synthesis. And again, the standard for that is going to be roughly one to two grams per kilogram. And there's always this debate, well, is it ideal body weight? Is it lean body mass? And the evidence from Stuart Phillips lab in, in Ontario is that it's current body weight. Uh, and, and that applies 
And the older we get, the more we need. And that is such an important point. You know, any, you know, slightly older, I'll say to be diplomatic, pre-diabetic or someone who's overweight who's listening to this, I, I would say you, you can't, you have to be careful cutting protein just for the sake of pricking your finger and seeing that your ketones or peeing on a stick and seeing that your ketones are, are in, in whatever range you want. Um, uh, it's, I'd say there's a, there's a downside to that. While I am an advocate of a low carb diet and even an advocate of ketosis, um, albeit perhaps not quite as enthusiastically as I am just low carb, because those aren't the same things, ketosis versus low carb, but they're both good. And I, and I think scientifically, they're very, very easy to defend and justify. But the older we get, the more we need to be mindful of, am I getting enough protein? Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think uh, there's a tendency right now, especially just because it's become very popularized, to uh, sometimes go out of your way to eat more fat than you really need to. I think the idea is to to replace the carbohydrates in your diet with something that's not going to raise your insulin and, and blood sugar. And fat is a good substitute, but we don't need to go out of our way to stuff extra fat in and especially yeah. uh, to uh, cut down on, on necessary protein. And that's, of course, you know, there's, uh, there's some sort of range there that is, is likely individualized as far as how much protein we really need. You give a, uh, a good starting point. I'm curious about that, uh, the research that you referenced with current body weight. Mm -hmm. uh, why do you think that is? If so, somebody has, it, it seems to me like if, uh, you know, there's a difference of 30 or 40 pounds and, and it's mostly fat from one individual to the next, they wouldn't need extra protein to, uh, to fuel that uh, metabolism. But yeah, no, that's a, you're, you're right. You're right. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, that's a great question. I've not seen that question answered. So the way I end up addressing that as I've started fielding some questions since my talk, it is that if someone, if the goal is weight loss, then I would say there may be some justification to go on the lower end of that, you know, that one to two grams per kilo or, or indeed maybe focusing on ideal weight because no one, it's very uncommon that someone knows their lean body mass. Uh, I, I know mine because I just got tested two weeks ago because we have a facility here on campus, but the average person doesn't know what their lean body mass is. And so in that case, that's almost irrelevant to say. So I'd say going perhaps with ideal body weight. Um, and then if the goal is um, I want to maximize uh just general health and even performance. And I don't mean performance like someone who's exercising, but even just I physically want to be capable. You know, I want to go hiking with my grandkids or skiing with my grandkids or whatever. And that is my priority. As a middle-aged father, why I eat the way I do uh, really is this long game where I want to be a really fit grandpa. You know, and my kids are still little, but I'm just looking ahead and I want to be able to get down and wrestle with my grandkids in you know, 20 years. Uh, and, and I don't want to be losing my muscle mass. And so for me, mind you, I am already at my ideal body weight, uh, but I make sure I'm being very deliberate with my protein and not to um, uh, harp on this too much, but when we're talking protein, uh, they're not all not all amino acids are created equal when it comes to muscle protein synthesis and and I would say if if there's an older person listening who is wondering well i'm am I getting enough protein if you don't think you are boy I, I would say and I don't make any money off this i don't make I don't make any amino acid supplements but I, I would say get some leucine the amino acid leucine and and I don't know, take like one little teaspoon or something. I don't know. Uh, every evening, right before you know, an hour or so before you go to bed, um, to to minimize the pro the muscle loss, the proteolysis that happens while we sleep. Great, uh, great advice, or or at least some branch chain amino acids is, or sometimes easier. Right. To find, yeah. 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 Great. Uh, so this is something I always like to ask, and we're a little deep into the interview, but I think it'd, it'd be a great time to bring it up. Uh, and it sounds basic, but I don't think it's as basic as it sounds. I, I just love to hear your definition of diabetes. We know it's not just as simple as high blood sugar, even though conventionally sometimes it's looked at that way. So how how do you uh, describe diabetes? Yeah, so are we talking type 2? or Type 2 diabetes, thank yeah, you. Yeah, great. I describe type 2 diabetes as insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia. 
it, it, I hate to make that complicated. And so if so, if you're going to allow me to put an and in there, that's the, that's how I define it. It is hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. And I didn't even say the word glucose because that's just as much a symptom of the insulin resistance as all of the other disorders I would submit that come with it. In fact, that's what first, my first steps into becoming an insulin resistant scientist as a younger graduate student, it was wondering what is it about an expanding waistline or a body that's gaining fat that connects it to disease. And my, my perspective on this has matured and, and developed and gotten more polished over the years. Um, but it really is the insulin resistance well and the hyperinsulinemia those two events which overwhelmingly come together mind you if you resolve the hyperinsulinemia you begin to resolve the insulin resistance and of course the easiest way to resolve the hyperinsulinemia is to control the amount of glucose you have coming in which comes back to the low carb or the, rel the relevance of a low carb diet but to me type 2 diabetes is you know is hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. And the, the, the tragedy is that we focus on glucose, like I said, but it is forgivable. You know, if we look, if we look historically, the main, in fact, we call the disease diabetes because of the polyuria, right? And, and so the person, historically, we noticed this person was urinating a great deal. We could detect the glucose in the urine very simply, if perhaps in a somewhat disgusting manner, you know, they could detect the glucose. And so it's forgivable that we looked at it as a glucose disease. It really is. And so, uh, you know, my, I have nothing but respect for these early philosopher scientists who came to these conclusions that it was a diabetes disease and looking at it in a di in a glucose, sorry, that it was a glucose disease and giving it that glucose centric paradigm. However, it's less and less forgivable as time goes on, where we see that when we have clinical interventions in a type 2 diabetic that are aiming to improve the insulin, you know, lower the insulin, rather than trying to lower the glucose, lowering the insulin always works better. Mm -hmm. You know, when we are, when we are um, addressing, you know, with the GLP-1 receptor agonists, um, although that actually has two effects. It's almost uh, where it's increasing insulin, but also activating brown fat, which is lowering glucose very powerfully. Um, but we have metformin and, and just low carb changes uh, that allows this insulin to come in check. But when we're trying to control glucose by bumping up the insulin even higher, that's when things go terribly wrong for the type 2 diabetic. You know, when we give them insulin or a sulfonylurea to induce insulin release and bump their insulin levels up even higher, they gain weight faster, they die from cancer more often, and they die from heart disease. And this is all, these are all published results. And so by focusing on trying to lower the glucose in insulin levels, we just sort of toss them up through the roof. That's dangerous. But when we're focusing on what can we do to lower the insulin, then we're suddenly cooking with gas. We're really solving the problem. Wow, I think uh, you did a great job explaining that. And hopefully there's some practitioners listening who maybe don't have a good understanding of that. And, and this can clear things up because you're absolutely right. It's becoming more and more unforgivable as the science is, is yep. emerging. And we really need to change our perspective on that. In fact, Brian, it was uh, I, about, uh, about a month ago, I gave a talk uh, here within Utah Valley in Provo Orem area where, where the campus is. Um, I, from time to time, give talks to little clinics or doctor's offices, and I gave one about a month ago, and I, I showed these data, the actual papers showing that insulin and sulfonylurea-treated diabetics had these, you know, like a 90% greater risk of mortality from cancer and a three times greater risk of heart disease. I showed those studies, and at the end of my talk, this physician's assistant who was sitting right near me at the front, this older fellow, um, he looked at me with tears in his eyes, and he said, Ben, you're telling me that I'm killing my type 2 diabetics. And I, 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 I felt empathy for the guy, but I also was glad. And I said to him, I am sorry to be the one to tell you this, but I'm glad for you to know because there's a better way to do it than we have been. And to his credit, he was humble enough to acknowledge it and determined enough or, or – appreciates his job enough, like what, what the essence of that clinician is to, to, to help the patient be healthier, that he didn't take it offense. He didn't take offense at what I was saying. He didn't try to think, ah, oh, Ben, you're just trying to push some strange idea. He saw the data and 
nothing convinces like data mm. and and it convinced him he he could see the error and he could also see the the relevance in what he'd also seen in his patients where whenever the patients would come he was always having to up the dose up the dose up the dose up the dose whatever the medication was it was upping the dose and now i have this series of physicians that i visit with and not consult with that makes it sound too formal it's nothing like that um, that I have a relationship with. And these, these physicians that are putting their diabetics on low-carb patients, or on low-carb diets, they, to hear their enthusiasm and excitement um, is, is refreshing because rather than upping the dose, they're now lowering the dose, lowering the dose, lowering the dose, and then eventually deprescribing the medication entirely. And they have never been able to do that. Never. They were never able to get a patient off medication. It was, it was inconceivable. And now it's happening. Every week, they have several patients that are getting off one or two or multiple medications with blood pressure or antihyperglycemics, whatever it may be. It's it's very gratifying for me because I'm not a clinician to see the clinicians experiencing the real time benefits in their patients. It's a very very gratifying thing to see, and it, and it, it's again supported in the evidence. Amazing. Yeah, and I, uh, I agree. I, I see that as well a lot in our patients and clients, and that's what uh, I think drives us to, to do what we do. Uh, I have to ask, as an insulin resistance scientist, uh, there is another model out there, and uh, this is being uh, pushed by a lot of people in the vegan community, and it's this model that insulin resistance is caused by ectopic fat, fat stored yeah. in the liver, in the muscles, and by cutting fat down to almost zero in the diet, this is the this is the uh, the approach that they decide to use. Uh, then we're going to burn that fat and yep. reverse the insulin resistance. I that way. love that you asked me this question <laughs> because I don't know that I've ever been able to talk about this before. So um, that's absolutely uh, the th- ectopic lipid deposition. So fat getting stored in non adipose tissues and causing insulin resistance, huge justification for that. And I've published papers, my whole postdoc looked at that, what can happen when fat is accumulating in non-fat tissue. And not that it's, there's a, several um, essential points to mention here. One is that the normal form of storage of fat storage is triglycerides. That's the typical fat storage molecule. That in and of itself is totally benign. We could, we could put triglyceride into the liver, triglyceride into the, um, it may cause fatty liver disease, or triglyceride into the muscle, but that does not antagonize insulin signaling. What happens is that we, as this excess lipid theoretically is getting dropped off in tissue, it gets converted into non-triglyceride fat or types of lipids like something called sphingolipids the main one, the main type of that lipid is called ceramides. And that's very much an active part of my research. No question, ceramide, which is a type of lipid, antagonizes insulin signaling and causes insulin resistance. That is absolutely correct. However, for a vegan to try to usurp that sentiment and wrap that up into a justification to avoid dietary fat is absolutely unjustified. That is not Let me be perfectly clear, lipotoxicity or ectopic lipid deposition is not mitigated by suddenly not eating fat. So with regards to ceramides very specifically, just last year, my lab, we published a paper that found that insulin, elevated insulin levels are sufficient to induce this accumulation of these toxic lipids like ceramides and sphingolipids that directly antagonize uh, insulin signaling. And that wasn't because we were feeding the animals too much fat, far from it. All we were doing was giving them more insulin, and that caused the same problem. And so, to to um, but that's an important that's an important idea to tease apart. So even in my own research, part of my process, <clears throat> sometimes painful of of really coming to appreciate the benefits of a low carb diet and indeed the benefits of dietary fat, only happened when I stopped looking at insulin resistance purely through the lens of biochemistry and started looking at it also through the lens of physiology, which is sort of my two academic backgrounds. All of the models in animals and humans that were finding that fats were causing insulin resistance, 
they were doing two models. One, they were directly treating cells with fat. So they had a, a little dish with the cells growing on the dish and they would squirt some fat into that dish. And then, oh, yep, these, fat, these cells take in the fat, they develop these sphingolipids and now insulin isn't working as well. That was one model. And then the second model in rodents and humans, they directly through intravenous infusion, put fat right into the blood. And sure enough, it causes insulin resistance. Now, there's a problem though with those two models, and it took me time to realize this. While both of those models suggest that when you are bombarding the cell with a lot of fat, it causes insulin resistance, what it's not proving is that eating fat causes the same thing. And indeed, you don't have to look very far at all. If we're looking at blood levels of fat, we're looking at triglycerides and free fatty acids, guess what happens when someone eats a low-carb diet? They plummet. They plummet. And so the vegans, bless their hearts, by insisting on the ectopic lipid deposition model or paradigm for insulin resistance, they're making the low carb case that all the, all that much stronger. Because if you believe that it's a matter of uh, fat getting to the cell and getting put into the cell <clears throat> and too much that it can't use it all, insulin tells that to happen. Mm -hmm. Insulin will tell a cell, hey, you're loaded with energy. I don't care. Uh, I have energy coming in. I've got to put it somewhere. You're taking it up. Whoever you may be, the muscle cell, the bones, the, the liver, what kidneys, it doesn't matter. You need to take up this excess. Insulin tells that to happen, and it won't happen unless insulin tells it to. And so if you're keeping your insulin in control, you have almost no fear, almost. I'm being diplomatic. You have almost no fear of ectopic lipid deposition. It just won't happen. Is there anything else that can inhibit the ceramides uh, other than keeping your insulin low? Any other yeah, strategies? Um, yeah, so uh, the main, I'm going to twist your question around a little bit. Okay, sure. Maybe what else, what else promotes ceramide accumulation and inflammation does. So that was, in fact, all of my, my postdoctoral fellowship was identifying and teasing out these particular biochemical pathways. Um, how does inflammation cause ceramide to accumulate in macrophages and muscle cells and liver cells and then cause insulin resistance in, say, muscle and liver? And we could even go as far as to add nerve, neurons and, and brain to that. Um, and that was inflammation. So, so we have – and what's relevant about inflammation is that saturated fats – promote inflammation more than monounsaturated fats. So palmitate promotes more inflammation and ceramide accumulation than oleate does. But once again, the temptation is then to say, oh, well, then don't eat saturated fat and just eat unsaturated fats. But that's not the same thing. Because even once again, even if someone's eating a lot of saturated fats, their blood saturated fat levels are just the same, if not lower, than the person who's eating very, very little or no saturated fat. So once, and this is published. So once again, the person who's insisting on the relevance of the ectopic lipid deposition or lipotoxicity theory, that does not justify excluding dietary fat. And moreover, when people want to be afraid of saturated fat, they're saturated fat and fruit fats too. You know, the, the vegan who wants to say, well, don't eat beef because it has saturated fat. Well, there's a lot less saturated fat in beef than there is in coconut oil, mm -hmm. for example. And so we can't be naive as a general just population, community, low carb or vegan, to just think that there's something inherently wrong with the fat that you get from meat. That is absolutely silly. It's just silly. You can get those same fatty acids from almond, from nuts, as you can from olives, as you can from avocados, <clears throat> or any a number of non-meat sources. Great clarity. Uh, yeah, maybe, and, uh, maybe I'm a little too deep. I don't <laughs> think so. I, okay. You know, I think people need to hear this because there, there's a big push out there right now. And I get questions about it every single day on our blogs and in our, on our videos and uh, emailed to us. So uh, this, is, this is fantastic. And I'm just- Yeah, well, if I, if I had to sum it up, I'm, I'm afraid that I maybe went a little, was a little too long-winded. And so at the risk of even going longer, the 30 second takeaway is, yes, there's just, there's support to suggest that tissue, non-fat tissue taking up fat causes insulin resistance, but there's not- that is not justification to eliminate dietary fat because that isn't what puts the fat in the tissue in the first place. 
it's insulin. Perfect. I'd like to ask you a little bit about your work because I think the work you're doing is amazing and it's so needed. And I know uh, in the low carb community and, and certainly in the diabetes community, I'm very, very appreciative of, of the research you're doing and, and the message you're getting out there. Thank you. You're welcome. So uh, what I'd like to ask is if there's a, if there's a message, you know, sort of a central message to your work, if, if you were to, uh, you know, retire today, which I know you're not going to, and you've got years and years ahead of you of, of continued research. But if you were going to kind of hang it up today and there was a central message for uh, what you had uh, concluded or summarized or, or found to this date, uh, what do you think that message is? What a great question, Brian. Um, if I have made any contribution, and I'm thinking of even the articles that we have, you know, that we're about to submit, the current work that we're doing, I would want one conclusion from my work to be living a life that keeps insulin in control is a cardiometabolically healthy life. That would be the sum, is, is that one of my goals is to really show people just how pathogenic insulin is. Now, we need it. Thank heavens, the system is designed to have insulin and we're glad we have it. But the consequence of our current lifestyle is we are living a life when insulin is almost constantly elevated or every waking moment because they start the day with a starchy meal and they're told, well, you need to snack. So two hours later after their starchy breakfast, right when insulin is just about to come down, well, they bump it back up. Then two hours later, they have their starchy lunch. Right when insulin was about to come down, they bump it back up. And, and so we are living in a life, we are living in a world that just keeps pushing our insulin levels ever higher. And that is driving virtually every chronic disease from, from too much body fat uh, to Alzheimer's disease to breast and prostate cancers, which are very much linked to insulin resistance, to you know, liver disorders. Uh, infertility, you know, the most common form of female infertility is polycystic ovarian syndrome, and that is very much a disease of insulin um, inhibiting estrogen production from the ovaries. Nevertheless, we can just go from top to bottom and find a, a chronic disease that is somehow either caused by or exacerbated by insulin and hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance. So, the longer and more of a lifetime spent with low insulin levels, the leaner and healthier a person's going to be. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and I think this cardiometabolic spectrum of disorders, which type 2 diabetes and, and a lot of the other conditions you mentioned are on, uh, really is, is a much more accurate way to, to talk about diabetes and to talk about these problems. Yeah. The second question that I, I love to ask uh, my guests is, uh, just to get really practical, if you had a, a good friend or a family member that was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and you had three minutes to kind of give them your best advice on what to do, what would you tell them? Yeah, so at the risk of being unoriginal, I would, I would quickly cite the, the three steps that I kind of ended my low-carb Breck talk with, and that was very deliberate. You know, I, I did want there to be a takeaway, and so I would, I would emphasize those sort of three pillars, which is control your carbohydrates, and then I can, I'll elucidate that more in just a second, but make sure you're getting enough prior, uh, protein, so prioritize protein, and then all the rest of your calories, just to make sure you have enough energy just to live and, and move and survive and thrive rather than waste away. The third is fill all the rest of your calories with fat. Now, what form? I mean, someone could hear that, control carbs, prioritize protein, fill with fat, and then still say, well, what does that look like? To me, very practically, it would mean don't eat starchy, sugary things for breakfast. So start your day either... Um, either you uh, avoid breakfast and it's just a glass of an herbal tea or a green tea or whatever. Now, what I did this morning, I had a glass of tea and I just cracked an egg into it and I blended it up. Um, and that was what I drank. I mean, so people are always adding oil to their, their morning drinks and the oil, sure, it gives you energy in the form of fat, but to me, there's, there's a, better way to do it. And, and so, so I look at something like an egg yolk, which has like virtually every molecule for life, you know, all these wonderful macronutrients and the countless essential micronutrients that we need. So anyway, nevertheless, start with a, a breakfast, 
that is low in starch and sugar. Don't start your day by bumping up your insulin. And then continue to be very diligent with lunch. Don't, rather than, you know, jumping onto some big sandwich or something, you know, look at, look at some other kind of uh, meal options that are higher in fats and proteins. I am a huge advocate of eggs, especially if someone's on the go, you hard boil eggs. And if you keep them in your shell, in the shell, you can put them in a Ziploc and toss them in your backpack or your bag, and they're going to be fine four hours later, no problem. Um, but, you know, things like cheese sticks and, you know, whatever. Uh, so keep breakfast and lunch, be very diligent with. And then dinner, eat dinner. And, and if that's with a family, and, and it's not going to be a very, very low-carb meal because it's family time and that's the rest of the family doesn't eat low-carb, if there's an easy way to slightly alter your own meal to make it low-carb, then do it. But if it's going to disrupt a family dynamic, then I'd say there, there are more important things than, than even insulin control at every moment of the day. So eat that meal with your family and enjoy it, but then be done. And that's sort of the next step. Once you've eaten dinner, don't eat again. Give yourself that 12 or so hours from dinner until breakfast to really get your insulin down and maybe even make some ketones overnight. There's evidence, there's a paper to show that by inducing ketogenesis in the evening, that may be one of the most effective therapies at controlling cognitive decline as we get older. And so once you've eaten dinner, just do your best. And I'll say do your best. And I mean it because for me, that's the hardest time of the day to control my appetite. When I'm home, I've, we've eaten dinner, you know, we're doing homework with the kids, you know, doing piano lessons with the kids. And, and, then, and then we put the kids to bed. My wife and I just sort of split it up. Um, we sort of rotate who puts who to bed. And once the kids are in bed, my brain, my belly, whatever it is, it, it, it's, it's, I just start you know, I, I, I start craving. I want something. I want to eat something. And, and that's the hardest time to control my appetite. And yet it, I would argue maybe the most important because I find that once I start indulging, uh, it's very hard to stop. Yeah, I would back that up. And I, I think not just you and I, but uh, you and me, but, but it seems like that's a very, very common issue for people. So that's where I'll usually break out the, the herbal tea is at night yes yeah, so, so that, that me, helps yeah so for me i will get a big um glass of uh, club soda just normal carbonated water with ice and i'll put in a couple tablespoons of apple cider vinegar and i actually have really come to enjoy that that very that kind of the sour but also this little hint of the apple that's in there i love it but i think there's enough of that kind of acidity in that apple cider vinegar that it really helps um you know kind of sh shove my appetite into control yeah, uh, bitter foods uh, can suppress appetite. So, you know, if you have to indulge on something, a little piece of dark chocolate or some cacao nibs, um, sometimes, <laughs> not a lot of people are going to do this, but sometimes I'll chew on some spinach at night to because uh, it suppresses the appetite and it kind of gives me something to chew on and, you know, it's virtually calorie free, got some good nutrition. That's a great but point. Yeah, so uh, so that those are some good strategies. Yeah. All right, my last question for you today, and this is a big one. I think it's important in the state the way the world is is moving right now. And the question is, if you're you're sitting around the table with the world leaders, let's say ten to twenty uh, countries, presidents or world leaders, and you're there as as an expert, and they ask you how to solve the diabetes epidemic. What would you tell them? Yeah, I would say remove all language in dietary guidelines about avoiding um, any real food. If it's a real food, remove any language. Meat, stop it. Stop trying to insist that there are data in humans proving that meat is going to kill you. Those are all correlational studies, and there are even clinical studies to show. There was a study that put um, a group of men on a 50% saturated fat diet. 50% saturated fat. They were pretty much eating nothing but meat and eggs. And what happened? They lost weight. Their blood lipids got better. They, uh, there was no negative reports. So I would say stop vilifying any real food. Remove any language about saturated fat and focus on sugar. That's just the low-hanging fruit. 
Now, I'm not saying we can never eat sugar again. That's silly. I'm not saying that. I, I love ice cream. And I love to know that if I'm going to go out on a little date with my eight-year-old daughter, you know, if she says, Daddy, can we get ice cream? I'm going to get some ice cream with my eight-year-old. You know what I mean? And we're going to love it. And so I'm not saying that we just cut it out. That's, that's silly. But, but I would say that we've got to scrutinize where it is and really evaluate um, how much of it we're getting. And when I say where, you know, I don't want sugar in my peanut butter or my ketchup or my mayonnaise. And yet try to find a peanut butter or a ketchup or a mayonnaise that doesn't have sugar. Try to find a loaf of bread. I'm not going to eat the loaf of bread anyway, but try to find a loaf of bread that doesn't have sugar as like the second or third ingredient. And little granola bars that market themselves as healthy, sugar will probably be the second ingredient. And so I would say, let's get sugar out of foods where we don't want it anyway. And then rather, if, if it's a treat, well, then it's a treat. And then you know, one of my biggest frustrations is my kids come home from some church activity or some school activity, and we're pretty good about sugar in the house. And they bring home some big bag of like little gummy candies, you know, and it's like two pounds of gummy candies. And I don't want to be the bad guy that says, give me your stinking gummy candy so I can throw them in the garbage. And I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to create that antagonistic perspective that they look at dad and think, oh, dad's this policeman who's trying to take my sugar. And so nevertheless, that's kind of maybe just a, a, an evidence of just a bigger problem that sugar has become just pervasive <clears throat> mm -hmm. in, our, in our culture because it ha has invaded virtually every packaged food. And so I usually say that if it comes in a bag or a box with a barcode, it's probably a food to avoid. So what would I tell them? Don't vilify any sort of real natural food um, that, is, that is sort of naturally made. And then plants or animals and rather vilify uh, sugar, especially uh, as the main thing to identify in processed foods that's so problematic. There you have it. Dr. Benjamin Bickman, thank you so much for spending this time. That was uh, mind-blowing and uh, really valuable. I think people are going to love this. So I want to thank you for your time today and for being oh, part thanks, of Brian. the Mastering Blood Sugar podcast. Thank you so much. You got it. For everybody else who's with us today, thanks for being part of this and for listening to podcasts this week. We'll be back next week with another expert interview.